In the beginning, there is always hope. It thrives in every stadium on opening day. For every team last year is forgotten. Now, there are new challenges to be met and victories to be won. New faces and new names appear on each team. And in every stadium, the winds whisper of high hopes. For the Atlanta Falcons, a rookie from Texas A&M named Bubba Bean, number 44, made an impressive debut and seemed to justify his selection as the team's number one draft choice. Rookies like Bean can bring new spirit and energy to a team. Old pros make contributions too, with renewed determination and steady effort. Eleven years ago, Tommy Novis, like Bean, was a number one draft choice. Today, old number 60 can still single-handedly break up a sweep. The Falcons' opponents on Sunday were the Los Angeles Rams, a team that has successfully combined the old and the new into a devastating machine. The seasoned Ram defense sacked Steve Bartkowski five times and stole three of his passes. On offense, John Capaletti and Lawrence McCutcheon gained over 100 yards apiece. But the scoring was done by quarterback Ron Jaworski, who ran for one touchdown and passed for another. But the fact is that the Rams are so much stronger than the rest of the teams in their division that they could win the title with George Plimpton playing quarterback. Last year, they won their division by seven games. This year, says a local sports writer, they could clinch the division title by September 26th. Title talk is a current event in Los Angeles, but in Green Bay, Wisconsin, it is but a reminder of things long past. The once great Packer dynasty has washed away like a sandcastle. And last Sunday, the hopes for a new fortress were swamped by a wave of cocky San Francisco 49ers who defeated the Packers 26 to 14. Last season, the 49ers running attack was the second worst in all of football. But hopefully, by this season, Delvin Williams, number 24, will have gained enough experience to make runs like this one a routine occurrence. Williams' touchdown was the longest scoring run of the week, but it was left to the old pros of the Washington Redskins to provide last Sunday's most thrilling moment. Listen, this is the opportunity we all been waiting for. This is what it's all about. Two things. Don't worry about the Giants. Everybody pull together and be physical. In 10 years of coaching, George Allen has never lost an opening game. But when Craig Morton passed the New York Giants into the lead, Allen's unbeaten streak seemed in jeopardy. Touchdown passes to Walker Gillette and Ray Rhodes, number 82, gave the Giants a 17-12 lead late in the fourth quarter. Washington's chances for victory seemed remote when quarterback and team leader Bill Kilmer was injured and forced to the sidelines. But for Bill Kilmer, there is only one way to leave a football field, and that is as a winner. With his face stitched and bandaged, Kilmer returned to action with 49 seconds left to play and threw a perfect strike to Mike Thomas to win the game for the Redskins. But the New York Giants are a good football team, and they, uh, they, they had a lot. Of, you know, they had, they came here to play and to beat us, and we knew it, and we had to rise to the occasion. I had a feeling all week it might come down to a close game like this, and it was going to matter of, of who was going to outgut the other guy. I think that the Giants stayed in there, played as 
a great game too, and uh, and it was a great game for the fans. I'm just, I think the guy that should get the game ball is Bubba Tire. He stopped this thing was bleeding so bad, and blood was in my eyes and in my mouth, and. I told him, I said, you got to stop this bleeding. And he went over there. He was better than any cut man in, in pro boxing. He got that thing all stopped up. And, and from there, it was just a matter of being able to connect and, and picking out the right guy. That's all. When asked how many touchdowns his team would score against the Seattle Seahawks, St. Louis receiver Mel Gray couldn't keep a secret. And why not? For very few offensive teams possess the balance and versatility of the St. Louis Cardinals. Terry Metcalf is a one-man ground game whose enormous talent nearly overshadows that of his running mate, NFC rushing champion Jim Otis. Quarterback Jim Hart is a proven winner, and Cardinal receiving is deep to the last man, in this case, rookie Pat Tilly. Against Seattle, St. Louis jumped to a 20-point lead. But Jack Patera's Seahawks have acquired a reputation as a come-from-behind football team, a reputation they upheld with class against the Cardinals. Rookie Jim Zorn's 72-yard hookup with Sam McCullum narrowed the Cardinal lead to 13. Later, the scrambling left-hander demonstrated the ability to improvise that has earned him a starting job in the NFL. Jim Zorn is the unchallenged hero of Pacific Northwest football fans, but despite his heroic efforts, few expansion teams have ever won their first NFL game. The comeback fell short. Speaking of comebacks, Joe Namath and the Jets began forging their comeback trail last week in Cleveland. Last year, the NFL's highest paid quarterback led pro football in only one category, interceptions. Still, Namath insists on putting the ball up over the middle, a tendency his receivers wish Namath would forget. Conversely, the Jet defense would prefer to forget 1975 a year in which the hapless Jets gave up just over three miles on plays just like this one, executed with precision by peerless Paul Warfield. Warfield's return home to Cleveland gives the rebuilding Browns a stable of receivers second to none in the NFL. His stabilizing presence should make erratic Mike Phipps a more consistent quarterback, but against the Jets, Warfield was overshadowed by defending AFC pass receiving champion Reggie Rucker, who caught five big passes, including three in New York's end zone. A year ago, an injury to Rucker or Phipps might have forced Cleveland to recall waivers on Gary Collins or Milt Plum. But when Phipps went down with an injury against the Jets, backup quarterback Brian Seip flaunted Cleveland's newfound depth with a scoring pass to reserve Steve Holden. The surprising Browns buried the New York Jets in convincing fashion. And rookie Jet head coach Lou Holtz has to be wondering why he ever left college football. On the other hand, head coach Ted Marchibroda is glad he chose not to leave the Baltimore Colts. 1975's Coach of the Year nearly abandoned Baltimore. But a closer look turns up three pretty good reasons to stick around. Number one, the Sack Pack, formerly the Looney Tunes, alias the best pass rushing line in pro football a year ago. 59 times they sat on opposing quarterbacks in 1975, and the offseason has merely sharpened their skills. Marty Broda's second reason for returning commands the Colts' offensive fortunes. A year ago, under Marty Broda's tutelage, Burt Jones blossomed into one of the NFL's finest all-around quarterbacks. The super-talented youngster combines all the raw physical tools of youth with all the poise and cool of a 10-year veteran. And though he occasionally meets insurmountable odds, his rapport with wide receiver Glenn Doughty has become a formidable scoring weapon.
Atlas sack pack, Burt Jones to Glenn Doughty, and thousand yard rusher Lydell Mitchell, number 26. Three pretty good solid reasons for Ted Marchabrota to hang around Baltimore a while. And you can bet the Super Bowl was in the back of his mind. If you've never before seen a real live Tampa Bay Buccaneer, here's what one looks like. This is Steve Spurrier, for nine years a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, following his Heisman year at Florida. Last week, Steve Spurrier almost gave Tampa Bay, Florida its first professional touchdown. Almost, but not quite. The Houston Oilers didn't give Spurrier many chances to score. John McKay's Buccaneers, in fact, were able to gain just barely 100 yards in their first official NFL action. And it didn't matter much whether the quarterback was Spurrier or rookie Parnell Dickinson of Mississippi Valley State College. Houston's Dan Pastorini had a somewhat easier time of it against Tampa Bay's fledgling defense. Number 44 running back Fred Willis was left all by himself to account for the Oilers' first touchdown of the season. In all, Houston succeeded on 19 of 27 pass plays, including the clincher from Pastorini to Ken Burrow, as the Oilers quite rudely welcomed the Bucks to the NFL 20 to nothing. Like Dan Pastorini, Cincinnati's Ken Anderson is now a six-year veteran quarterback. Unlike Pastorini, Anderson is about to become the NFL's all-time leading passer. Last week, Calvin Jones, Denver's five-foot, seven-inch cornerback, temporarily postponed the inevitable and gave the Broncos' offensive team a chance to celebrate the return of its number one man, running back Otis Armstrong, number 24. Armstrong gained 96 yards and was the main reason for a 7-3 Denver lead because Steve Ramsey's passing game was shot down by six sacks, three of them by Coy Bacon, number 79, the man the Bengals obtained from San Diego for just that purpose. Trailing 7-3 with only 10 minutes left, Ken Anderson turned to the man Coach Bill Johnson calls the best clutch receiver in the NFL, Chip Myers. Wide receiver Myers, number 25, who once played with two broken arms, this time was only playing with a broken nose, and he made the lead touchdown look easy. Number one draft choice Billy Brooks had been injured early in the game, but with receivers like Myers, Isaac Curtis, Bob Trumpy, and Bruce Coslett, number 88, Ken Anderson had little trouble passing the Bengals to two late touchdowns and victory over the Broncos. Meanwhile, in the glamorous New Orleans Superdome, another passer of some note was testing the defenses of newly installed head saint Hank Strand. Stram's new quarterback, Bobby Scott, found the Minnesota defense as tough as ever. Some New Orleans errors were forced, others were not. Viking coach Bud Grant said later, it was like stealing. I'd like this kind of game every week. Fran Tarkenton took advantage of every mistake and Chuck Foreman did his part too. Chuck Foreman and Brent McClanahan each scored twice, but it was Fran Tarkenton's 292nd career touchdown pass which caused the most uproar on the way to a 40-9 Viking romp.
This may be the season the bears awaken from the long hibernation of many windless winters. Last Sunday in Chicago, their defense displayed teeth in swarming over Detroit's Joe Reed and allowing only three points. But while the Chicago offense may still be in a cave somewhere, even a pistol loaded with blanks will scare most Lions, and Bob Avellini's pass to tight end Greg Latta set up the only touchdown the Bears needed to crack the whip over the Lions, 10-3. In Kansas City, the once mighty Chiefs trotted out for a year of rebuilding under the steady gaze of coach Paul Wigan, who must see his chances for a title as a little pale in comparison to those of the Raiders or Broncos. Pre-game warm-ups presaged problems for Kansas City, but once the contest started, it was the Chargers who seemed to be running true to form. Punts that travel in the wrong direction may not be a Tommy Prothrow innovation, but this one helped the Chiefs to a late 16 to 13 first half lead as Mike Livingston clicked on two scoring passes. This one to tight end Walter White. But the Chiefs victory dance was a mite premature for lurking in the San Diego offense was a wide receiver who's been haunting NFL defenses for 11 seasons. And for Charger signal caller Dan Fouts, it's nice to have a ghost around the house, especially when it's number 27, Gary Garrison. This Fouts to Garrison pass capped a 30 to 16 Charger win, a remarkably improved performance when those of you who have the stomach for it think back to the Chargers of last year. But in the AFC West, it will take a heap of improvement to unseat Al Davis' Oakland Raiders, who last week faced world champion Pittsburgh. Who could smile or sneer at a time like this? Certainly not a nervous John Madden, who's lucky enough to have a snake in his pocket. And number 12, Snake Stapler, struck quickly, deadly, as the Raiders took a seven to nothing lead after only two minutes on this pass to tight end Dave Casper. The Steelers forged ahead on this exquisite Franco Harris run and lateral to John Stallworth, who scored to make it a 14-7 Pittsburgh lead. A Terry Bradshaw pass to rookie T. Bell gave the champs a two-touchdown advantage in the third quarter. Again, the snake squirmed downfield and capped the drive with a shot to Fred Boletnikoff, whose diving catch proved once again that he's one of the best. Then the action doubled as a short score by Franco left the Raiders trailing 28 to 14 with less than three minutes left. Against almost any other team, the Steelers would have been home free, but oh, those Raiders are something else. Dave Casper's juggling catch kept Oakland alive. Cooley staying in the pocket, Stabler again fired to Casper, and the Raiders trailed 28 to 21. With time and hope shrinking, the Raiders' Warren Bankston got a piece of Bobby Walden's punt, and Silver and Black was on the move. This, then, was the crucial play. A fourth and ten do or die. And suddenly, Stabler was in the sights of number 75, mean Joe Green. But the snake is slippery. First and goal on the Steeler two, with a minute and nine to go. And what have we here? But a snake slithering in the short grass to make the score 28 all. A quick interception, and Oakland was in scoring range again, where with 18 seconds left, George Blant, oh whoops, a rookie named Fred Steinfurt got his first look at what it can mean to be a Raider. For Steinfurt, it was a hero's welcome. For the Steelers, a 31-28 stunner. 
a game that was not without some heated accusations and controversy. In all likelihood, these teams will be meeting down the road apiece in a more important battle. But, as they say, this one put the fat in the fire.